Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for GMs. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel, like this video, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. And a big thank you to all of our Patreon supporters for making everything we do here on YouTube possible. More on that at the end of this episode, but for today, we are taking a look at how to play a Battlemaster fighter in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. This is the classic archetype for Dungeons and Dragons. Everybody loves the Battlemaster fighter, especially us. So today we're going to go over how we would build two different variations on the Battlemaster fighter. We're gonna look at an archer and a melee combatant. The littlest change with this classic build, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything did introduce new maneuvers for the Battlemaster fighters, which both Kelly and I are gonna be taking in our builds today. So we're gonna look at the species, the ability scores, the feats, and the maneuvers that we might take while we're building a Battlemaster fighter. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. The Battlemaster fighter is amazing, and if you have never played one over the many years of Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, you really should try it out, because I don't know about you, Kelly, but I have played many different human fighters over the course of 5e, and every time I have a blast. There's the idea out there that human fighters are boring in Dungeons and Dragons, but in my opinion, that couldn't be more wrong. I think that human fighters are the cornerstone of what makes D&D amazing. And with the versatility of the fighter and the even further versatility of the battle master maneuvers, you actually get a really customizable character. And we're gonna showcase that by Monty and I building two different versions of a battle master fighter that operate entirely different on the battlefield, which I think is one of the benefits of a fighter is, although they're not necessarily as sneaky as a rogue, or they, they don't have the spell casting potential like a wizard or sorcerer, in terms of melee combatants, you can really take a fighter in any direction that you want. And that's one of my favorite things about fighters. It's all about what weapon and fighting style that you choose for your character. And Kelly and I, we love put, throwing down the big damage and so we both oriented towards the damage dealing builds, but there are other variations to play a more defensive, tanky oriented character. We're just not gonna be looking at those ones today <laughs> ourselves because we wanted to go for, the, for the, the classic in your face, take down the bad guys feel. But whether you are going sword and board, pole arm, great sword, great ax, crossbow, longbow, whatever weapon it is, you're gonna have an amazing time with the Battlemaster fighter and it's really worth tr trying things out. You really feel like you control the battlefield when you are playing the Battlemaster. Having all the maneuvers mean that there are lots of tricks up your sleeve that you can pull round over round and you're not just re reduced to, I attack. And what I love most about the maneuvers is that you're really rarely giving anything up with the best maneuvers. You're still gonna to get to throw down, make your attacks, do a bunch of damage, move around the board, but the maneuvers are that extra flair that applies on top that give you all those extra effects that you can use to get that big advantage in every single battle. And because your superiority dice get bigger as you level up, you get more of them as you level up, and they come back on a short rest alongside your juicy, juicy things like Action Surge and Second Wind, you can fight all day. <laughs> One of my favorite things about the Battlemaster is I come from the world where I'm a big fan of playing spellcasters. And what I like about that is you have a long list of options to choose from that you can kind of pick and choose what is going to bring the most utility, maybe the most damage. You can kind of mix and match spells into a spellcaster to solve a lot of problems. And in terms of melee combatants, the Battlemaster Fighter offers you the closest thing you can get to that in terms of melee combat in D&D, where you do have a long list of maneuvers. And although we are going to be looking at powerful combat focused builds today, I do want to point out that you don't have to use either of our builds. There are a lot of utility options hidden within the maneuvers that can be really beneficial and give you a lot to play around with. So I think that there is value in almost all of the maneuvers and depending on the flavor you're bringing to your character, there's a lot of versatility here. That said, I do think a couple of the maneuvers really outshine the others. Uh, and there's going to be a couple of must-have picks that both Kelly and I are going to be taking as we, as we go through these. And I will say that in Tell Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, there were no non-combat focused maneuvers. And as the Battlemaster fighter, you're really all about fighting things. And so if you are going to have any 
exploration or out of combat or social interaction abilities, that's going to have to come from your backgrounds, your skill proficiencies, and any other choices that you make with your character maybe regarding feats. Basically, you can count on having either a decent athletics or acrobatics, and depending on where you put your tertiary ability scores, maybe you can contribute a little bit to social interactions, but there's not really much for you in the character to do that. You're going to have to bring that from either, ta again, taking a background that supports that. But in any case, you know that once the swords are drawn, you're going to be the master of the game. I am going to do the classic Brand Surefire, Human Polar Master. I love that build, but I've been interested in building an archer fighter for a while. However, I'm definitely also going to be mm. a human. Uh, there are a lot of excellent uh, races or species out there that you can choose from. I just like a human fighter. I think it's kind of the the vanilla aspect of it is actually what I like about it because you can bring it alive in so many interesting ways. Not to mention a feat at first level is pretty great for this build. Yeah. The custom lineage also is a great option for any fighter. And I will say that especially with uh, the archery fighting style, uh, playing those Owlins or Aarakocra is really... <laughs> good to have that uh, aerial maneuverability. The classics for the fighter also include the dwarf, the goliath, the half-orc, but really I think you can't go wrong here. There's so many interesting ways that by choosing an interesting species for your character you can get extra abilities that you might not normally have had access to and even quasi-magical ones. So I find it hard to turn down a feat that's our bias. <laughs> so we're going human. Now, when it comes to ability scores, again, with one of us being a melee combatant, one of us being a ranged combatant, we did do something a little different with our ability scores. What did you take? Um, I put 15 in my strength and constitution. I dumped my intelligence. I put a 10 in my dexterity. And then I had a bit of a last minute change of heart. The rational part of me, the full-on min-maxer part of me, says I should have a 14 wisdom and an 8 charisma because the wisdom score is going to help for the awful, awful wisdom saving throws. So, officially, that's what you should do. But for Bran Surefire, I am going to go with 15 charisma because Bran Surefire's got to work on his branding. Uh, yeah, we're, we're going for the total, the, the total, like, nothing up here everything in here um <laughs> now 15 charisma or 14 i think uh i think i get a four um 14 yeah um while still getting to have 10 in dexterity so i don't have the penalty i am going for oddly enough my fighter is going to sort of bridge the gap between ranger rogue territory but baked into a fighter mm -hmm. so i'm going with the archer um, which means I want dexterity. So I have a 15 in dexterity and constitution. I'm dumping my strength and intelligence, but I am going to definitely have a 14 in wisdom and then a 10 in charisma. That's going to allow me to be a little bit more perceptive, a little bit more sneaky, and I'm going to kind of be able to be sort of that wilderness character, but a fighter. For my skills, I'm just going to grab athletics, and then intimidation and persuasion. And at that point, I really don't know <laughs> what, what I've got left uh, for, for skills for, th for this guy. So I think I'm just probably going to grab acrobatics or maybe even uh, try to be stealthy. But <laughs> it really doesn't matter at that point. For my character, acrobatics, perception, and stealth are the ones that I'm going to go with. Mm. And um, from there, we'll see. At first level, the big choices that we have to make for our characters as humans is we have to take our feet and we have to take our fighting style. And these are two things that you should pair together like wine and a fine meal. <laughs> and so for me, I'm going to take the great weapon fighting style that's going to let me reroll ones or twos on my damage die. I'm going to pick up that halberd and I'm going to grab Polar Master right away at level one. You get so much bang for your buck for taking this feat at first level. If you have never played a first level human fighter with Polar Master, it is amazing. Uh, and I definitely will say it is better if you have to play at level one than taking Great Weapon Master at level one. 
in a similar fashion, but on the archery side, I'm going to be taking the archery fighting style and I'm going to be taking crossbow expert. Yeah. What's interesting is like the argument about polearm master and great weapon master, the same thing applies here. We're taking crossbow expert allows me to have an additional attack with my crossbow. But if I were to take sharpshooter, which is going to be my level four choice for feet, but at first level, the minus five to hit can actually be pretty detrimental. Yeah. Whereas getting a full on second attack that you grant either through Polar Master or Crossbow Expert as your bonus action, you don't have any penalties to that attack bonus or your initial attack bonus. It's doubling your attacks at first level. It's too good to pass up, in my opinion. Um, the extra benefits that you get from both of these feats as well are really, really excellent. And naturally, of course, we're going to be taking our corresponding Sharpshooter and Great Weapon Master at level four. That, by that time, we've got, got a few more points in our proficiency bonus. Things are leveling up a little bit more, and those feats really start to come into their own then. So if you were going to do something different here, um, and you were going to go with a different weapon type or fighting style, then you might want to take a different feat here. But I really think it's awesome to secure your character's play style right away, and another thing that I love about this build. Second level is super uneventful in terms of character choices, but we are getting action search. So important, but there's <laughs> yes. no choices to be made here. You're just getting some cool yeah. stuff. Um, and third level is when we actually get to have our Battlemaster maneuvers now as we take the Battlemaster character archetype. So we thought we were going to be interesting being like, here's our first three maneuvers and here's why they're so different. It was actually really funny because I picked my three, Monty picked his three, we compared them, and we had, oddly for our characters, picked the exact same three starting maneuvers. So I guess these are the top three maneuvers. And what are they? So we have precision attack, trip attack, and pushing attack. This is like, this is like that pairing of like chocolate, caramel, and peanuts. You know, like that perfect like peanut butter parfait of awesome that just comes to life now with, with these three things. What I, what I think is really amazing here is these three have always been obvious, but a lot of people don't realize that all three of these maneuvers say weapon attacks. There's a lot of maneuvers out there that specify melee attacks, which yep. aren't going to work for my archer build. But I can trip from a distance, I can push from a distance, and I can be precise from a distance. So it really works well with yeah. the archery fighting style. Yes, knocking a creature prone means that as an archer, I now have disadvantage on shots against them. But the amount of utility that comes from knocking a creature prone, if they're next to the melee rogue or the paladin or the monk or anybody else who's a melee combatant and I'm able to knock them prone, guess who has advantage on them? Also for flying targets, knocking most flying targets prone will knock them out of the air. So being able to shoot a dragon and potentially knock it out of the air, amazing. I love trip attack for this. And when it comes to pushing attack, being able to, from a distance, move people around the battlefield, great. And for a melee combatant, being able to push your enemies into the right position and knock them prone to get advantage for yourself. Now note, with a polearm, if your enemy is 10 feet away from you at the furthest extent of your reach and you knock them prone, you'll actually have disadvantage on attacks against them. So you will need to be adjacent to your enemy, even if you're a polar master, to get the benefit of advantage against a prone enemy. Otherwise, you do have disadvantage. So watch out for that. But otherwise, phenomenal. Um, knocking your enemy prone keeps them in your reach makes it harder for them to get away from you, gives you advantage on your subsequent attacks, and it also helps set up your allies. Pushing attack, the positioning advantage, we've already talked about this, and precision attack is just that extra insurance policy. There are so many times that precise strike will turn that miss into a hit when you need to close the deal. Nothing is more disappointing playing a fighter than action surging and missing with your attack. And precision attack means that you can roll that superiority die and hopefully turn that miss into a hit. And sometimes it can be the decisive moment in battle. All the other maneuvers do a little bit of extra damage and those can be decisive, but especially once we combine our characters with sharpshooter and great weapon master, 
the minus five penalty that we get with attacking from those feats is also going to be counterbalanced by the fact that we can roll our superiority die and add that to our attack roll if we need to seal the deal. And that is going to be the plan for level four. We're taking yeah. those two feats respectively. With those feats, for me being an archer, sharpshooter does something more than just minus five plus ten. Yes, I'm going to be able to dish out a ton of damage, but also sharpshooter allows me to ignore half and three quarters cover, which means that I can now snipe people from a distance no matter what. As long as I can see any part of them, I can hit them. And that's really valuable and something that we probably yeah. should remember in our games more. Now, for me with Great Weapon Master, because I can already attack with a bonus action, the bonus action on a critical hit or slaying an enemy really just allows me to use a D10 for the attack damage instead of a D4. But ultimately, the damage bonus of Great Weapon Master is way too significant to ignore, especially when you're using Polar Master and a Halberd. We're, you're going to be basically at a point where once we get to fifth level and have extra attack, that's three attacks for both of our characters per per round. And that minus five plus ten now adds up to 30 extra damage, assuming all the attacks hit. And we've got lots of tools to help make sure that happens between the archery fighting style, precision attack, knocking enemies prone and moving up to them. All of these things mean that we now have a massive damage dealing capability on this character. And this is where your overall go-to strategy is going to come into play with both of these characters. At the start of combat, find the most dangerous enemy on the board, either take aim at them or charge forth towards them, action surge, and put five attacks into them. <laughs> and you're doing that at fifth level. And really, there's not a lot of enemies at level five that are going to survive that. Five attacks, and if you manage to land the minus five plus ten on all of those attacks, yeah. that's 50 damage, again, assuming that you hit with all of them, 50 damage just from the feats that we chose. Yes, and what's significant about the strategy usually, is particularly for the Polar Master, is you want to move up to that enemy and you really want to hopefully knock them prone with trip attack so you get advantage on all your subsequent attack rolls. Um, this is where the Polar Master can sometimes come out a little bit ahead, but the disadvantage, of course, is that the sharpshooter has all the ranged attacks and can just put the damage exactly where it needs to go. If there's enemies in the way, doesn't matter. <laughs> that is the benefit, is I do get to pinpoint my target. And although I might be relying on my final attack to knock the enemy prone so that now my allies can run in and do their job, it still is a great battlefield tactic to just hang in the back lines and pepper arrows into mm -hmm. your enemies. Pretty much... I use the power attack feature of Great Weapon Master or Sharpshooter as long as the enemy isn't wearing full plate and a shield. That's about the point where you probably think their armor class might be too high, um, where you're getting a bit of the diminishing returns. Strictly speaking, AC 18, 19 is about the cutoff point. So if you know your enemy has an AC of 18 or lower, go for it. Uh, mathematically, it's, it's stronger, but with all the tools that you have at your disposal between knocking them prone and precise strike, you might be able to even go more aggressive than that. At level six, we're going to get another ability score increase or feat. I think that now that we're playing around with Great Weapon Master and Sharpshooter, yeah. I think it's time to up our main stats. For me, it's going to be dexterity. For me, it's going to be strength. This is one of the things I love about the fighter, getting that ability score increase at level six, being the human fighter. So many other characters have to wait until level eight to get great weapon master and sharpshooter and as a human battle master fighter we've been playing with these since level four and we're still going to get to level eight with a max out primary ability score and these feats there's not a lot of other characters that can do that because of that extra feat the fighters get here at this level at level seven we're going to gain two additional maneuvers now we already have our favorite maneuvers selected mm -hmm. but now we start to get to play around with some of the unique options in the maneuvers for myself i went with maneuvering attack and one of the new maneuvers which is ambush 
So maneuvering attack is actually going to allow me to hit a target, deal some extra damage, and allow an ally to get into a better position. This works great for my archer because from a distance, I can shoot a target and allow one of my melee combatant allies to move up to that target. And with Ambush, I can add a superiority die to either my stealth or my initiative, both of which are going to be pretty great for my dexterity-based character, who is already going to be pretty decent at stealth and pretty good at ambushing. This kind of gives them that weird sort of assassin vibe without having to play a rogue or, or a ranger. For me, I'm going to be taking Repost. The reason why I love taking this maneuver for the Polar Master Battlemaster Fighter really comes down to the fact that it gives you so many ways for your reaction to trigger on your turn. Your reaction can trigger and you get an attack because your enemy comes into your reach. But then if they were already there and they attacked you and they missed, now you're going to be able to attack them again. If they tried to get away from you, you would also be able to get an opportunity attack. Obviously, we're still only limited to one reaction per turn, but between repost, the regular opportunity attacks, as well as uh, pull our master, there are so many ways that that reaction can trigger. We're getting lots of extra reaction attacks happening. I'm also gonna pair this with bait and switch. Bait and switch is a new maneuver from Tasha's that I was shocked by when I saw Joe use this one for the first time because it's really good. It allows you to change positions with one of your allies as part of your movement, swapping what squares you're in. And then as part of that maneuver, you get to roll your superiority die and add that result to either the ally's AC or your AC. <laughs> and this is where these two maneuvers are amazing because repost triggers on a missed attack. And so now I'm increasing my AC, <laughs> making it harder to hit me. And if they don't hit me, boom. It also gives you that sort of protector vibe of like, if the yeah. sorcerer or wizard is surrounded, you can pop them out, pop in, bolster yourself up, and then repost. Well, there's so many ways to move people around with this character now. And this is also why I'd be really tempted to take Sentinel. Um, but I kind of want the ability score boosts. And that's where we are actually coming to level eight, where we get yeah. another ability score increase or feet and i think we already have our bread and butter feats here i just want to max out my dexterity yeah. get the most out of this character on the battlefield i am really tempted to take sentinel but i leave it up to you if you feel if you have a magic weapon <laughs> uh take sentinel if you don't and you are or you feel that you're happy with your accuracy uh maybe you take the ability score increase there are a number of feats that I will be mentioning that I am considering. So this is one of those places where it's up in the air. For myself, I'm probably going to max out my dexterity. Yeah. But you could go a different way with this build and start taking some of the other feats that amplify the, uh, the concept that we're going for. As we skirt on past level 9 and pick up Indomitable at level 10, we're also going to get to take two more maneuvers. Here, I kind of feel like I'm starting to scrape the bottom of the barrel a little bit, and I like to branch out and take a couple more fun, interesting, or niche maneuvers because I feel like I've got the core of what I want to do covered. So for me, I'm going to take Quick Toss, and I'm going to take Commanding Presence alongside that. Both of these are new. And what I really like about Quick Toss is sometimes you just need to huck a javelin at somebody. And while it is worth remembering that I don't have any ranged attacks, I'm still going to be carrying javelins with this character. And I cannot tell you how many times Joe in our Draconheim campaigns has used a javelin and thrown it and use trip attack on the thrown javelin to knock something out of the sky. So you might think that just the crossbow expert has that trick, but that's actually something that the melee characters can do too, because you can have a strength-based thrown weapon that you can huck and trip someone, and sometimes you just can't close the distance and you just want to whip out a javelin and throw it. You get to draw it as part of this. We got nothing in the other hand. Don't even have to put down the pole arm. And then I took commanding presence, which is basically precision attack, but for social attacks. <laughs> <laughs> and with your little bonus to charisma that you took, this, yes. this actually does match the theme of your character. Yeah. He's the boisterous fighter. Yeah, so at least I can make those intimidation and persuasion roles and, and not be completely inept at it. For myself, I picked menacing attack and disarming attack. 
Uh, again, we're looking at slightly more niche. I do like menacing attack because I can choose to try to scare the target that I hit. Again, this maneuver is going to allow me to add my superiority die as damage, so it's doing that. Plus the chance to frighten the target, that's just fun. I don't know how I'm frightening them. Getting shot with a bow is pretty scary though, so maybe they just didn't see it coming. You have a really cool combo there that you could pull off that I, I think is, is kind of nasty. You could conceivably on your turn, especially when you get to level 11 and have three attacks all the time and also your crossbow expert attack, you could start your maneuvers by disarming attack. They drop their item. You then use pushing attack to push them back 15 feet, then menacing attack to frighten them because a creature that's frightened can't move closer to the source of its fear. So you shoot the, the weapon yeah. out of their hand, push them back, and scare them. <laughs> You're getting where I'm going with this. So yeah, <laughs> the disarming attack is a relatively niche maneuver, but I love the idea of shooting something. First of all, the, the imagery of blasting something out of somebody's hand yeah. is so fun. They hold up, they're like, I've got the MacGuffin. No, you don't, and now it's out of their hand. And yes, I can pushing attack, I can menacing attack. I have a number of tools at my disposal to remove an object from an enemy's hand and then get them away from it. I could even use maneuvering attack to allow one of my allies to get <laughs> up to the object. So, oh, that's that's actually I want to see that happen. And you could really reliably make that happen. Like, ah, oh, that's good. There is the classic option here. It's it's a it's a fantasy action movie moment where I shoot the object we're after, out of the enemy's you hand. You shoot the spellcasters, you sh their wand or their orb or their staff out of their hand? Flies through yeah. the air and one yeah. of the allies runs up, jumps, oh, and grabs so it. so good. It's all there. Yep. I love it. So by this point, our fighters have come into their own. They've got lots of cool strategies, lots of cool tactics that they can employ on the battlefield. And at, by level 10, I really think you can go anywhere you want now with your battle masters. Obviously, level 11 is where we get that third attack, which is amazing. And at level 12, we've got our max out ability scores. We got room to take more feats. We're gonna get another feat at level 14. We're gonna get more maneuvers at level 15. We're gonna get more uses of action surge. If your campaign goes up to those higher levels, hopefully you got a really cool magic weapon too. But what would you take for your final couple feats? What would you consider? I'm considering between alert, which is kind of insane on this character because I am looking at that sort of survivalist. Yeah. Alert mixed with the ambush maneuver is kind of insane how high I can get my initiative. I can make yeah. sure I'm going first in combat. I also really like piercer just as an option to increase the potential of my, my shooting my bow or my crossbow. Uh, prodigy more skills, turn this character into a bit of a skill monkey and allow them just to have more to play with. And mobile, because again, my character not being a melee combatant doesn't necessarily love getting stuck in a pinch yeah. with a bunch of enemies. So mo mobile is just gonna help me with my maneuverability. At this point, I actually think that we have a fighter. If we're looking at these feats, we have a fighter that rivals the same play style that you're looking for in a ranger or rogue. And that's what I love about the fighter is, no, it can't quite do everything the rogue does, it can't quite do everything the ranger does, but if you look at the, the meat of what you hope to get out of the combat version of a ranger or rogue, we got it here, yeah. and it's, it's awesome. For me, as I said, Sentinel is at the top of my list, as is Resilient for Wisdom, because by this level, maybe I am a little bit upset about the number of times I've failed my wisdom saving throws. So after that, though, I think the sky's the limit. You could really pick any sort of feat you wanted. You could take Ritual Caster or Alert or Lucky or um, any of the Fae Touch, Shadow ch Touch, add a little bit, ma bit of Magic, Magic Initiate, whatever makes sense for your character. At, the, at this point, I think the decision making more goes to where is the campaign at now and what do you need to add into the character at that, this stage of the game. There you have the Battlemaster. In my opinion, this is one of the most versatile options in the entire game of D&D, especially when you're looking at the martial characters in D&D. The versatility here is incredible and you don't even have to use either of our builds. There are so many options with a Battlemaster fighter. 
So you really get to bring it to life in the way that you want. With the amount of feats and maneuvers that you get to choose, it is so customizable and so much fun to play. And anybody who tells you that a human fighter is boring hasn't tried a battle master fighter. This character rocks. And if and um the battle master fighter rocks. It's one of my favorite character builds and concepts in 5th edition D&D. And as we see the sunset on this edition, if you haven't had the opportunity to play one even for a one shot, put one together and play one. And if you're starting the starting the game, joining us in the Human Fighter is a classic for a reason, and this is it. So this has been a look at the Battlemaster Fighter in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. If you've played one, or are hoping to play one, let us know about your character in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible because we have an amazing Patreon community backing us up and supporting our work. If you enjoy what we do here on YouTube, please consider joining that community by following the links in the description below. And if you want to see a Battle Master Fighter in play, you can check out our live play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday evenings on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we got plenty more amazing guides for all the various character options in D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel, like this video, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.